Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Internet Society for inviting me to address you on your 20th anniversary. It is hard to believe, but 20 is a small number, given what I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to discuss, essentially, the brief history of the Internet. Now, that's a, a topic that's challenging at best and difficult uh, in the easiest case. So let's talk about the brief history of the Internet. What is the Internet? An innocent enough question. My ophthalmologist, Larry Godwood, had his father asking that question, what is the Internet? And Larry came up with a terrific answer. He said, the Internet? It's everything, past, present, and future. Well, his father, being a bit of a wise guy, said, look, son, I was in the Canadian Navy in World War II. And I was commander of a landing assault craft, number LCA-1375. Sonny, you go find that thing on your internet. Now, this is a half a century after the war, and Larry has to find this on the internet. So he went to the Canadian Maritime Museum after searching Google. That didn't help at all. And he found this picture. And this picture shows the ship that carried his father's assault craft just coming around the Straits of Gibraltar to engage in what was called Dragoon, basically an invasion of southern Europe during World War II. Trouble is, these folks hit a landmine, a sea mine, blew a hole in the hull of the boat. They plugged it with a lifeboat and basically limbered off to the Greek town of Pylos to get repaired. They spent two weeks getting it repaired, and these fighting men were getting impatient. So they hopped in their landing assault craft, and they visited Piraeus, the port of Athens. Now, you have to understand, the German army was there expecting this invasion. And these landing the craft salt come over the horizon. The Germans panicked, blew up the factories, and evacuated. Lucky for these guys, because they had no armament. They were basically undefended. So they came in, and the population said, you have liberated us. And they started socializing with the sailors on the ship. And guess what? There's his father's landing craft. And guess what? There's his father. That's the internet. It's all there. Ask the right questions, search around, and you can find it. So let's go further now. 1969, a very critical year in the history we're going to talk about. What happened in 1969? Well, for one thing, we put a man on the moon. Second thing is, the Woodstock Festival took place in New York, up in New York State. A bunch of crazy people running around doing different kinds of things. An event with probability zero occurred. The Mets won the World Series in baseball. Charles Manson went on a murderous killing spree in Los Angeles. Oh, and by the way, the internet was born. Well, nobody noticed. Even those of us who were putting it together didn't notice in some sense. But in fact, if you look at the impact, it had a greater impact probably than all of those events together. So, as we talk about some of the technology, you have to understand the key to the success of the internet was not so much in the technology that was being developed, but it was in the environment. For example, it was an era, a golden era, where creativity and ideas were flowing all over the place. It's an era not to be repeated, unfortunately. It was based on the openness that this society is, is based, has as their fundamental principles. Ethics, open, shared, free, trusted. Well, it was magnified by the players. The ARPA program managers, basically, they looked at long-range funding, high risk, high payoff, large funding supplies, program managers that were brilliant and had a limited term, so they had no agendas that they, that they would bring it to the party, which could affect long term. And in fact, they didn't interfere with the studies. The principal investigators, who were responsible for their search, took a very relaxed attitude. They allowed their researchers to do what they needed to do. They didn't dominate them. They allowed the graduate students to blossom and show their creativity. And thankfully, the graduate students did their thing, and they organized themselves into working groups, into cross-university efforts. And the underlying technology itself had the same flavor, a distributed control technology. Nobody was in charge. It was all, bring what you can, think about it well, and we'll put it together. Because we trust each other, we're going to share. It's all going to work together. So that environment 
was a key issue in bringing about the successful internet we have today. That was the magic. That was the magic that's not often talked about, but is back there in the history that we're celebrating today. So let's talk about the future, and then we'll go back to the detailed history. Everybody knows about the internet, obviously, more than the two billion who use it. Shucks, my nine-year-old granddaughter knows about it. My 99-year-old mother knew about it. It's penetrating every aspect of our lives, be it commercial, be it educational, be it entertainment. And if you go further now, you begin to see that the internet, in my mind, has only reached its teenage years. And that gives you a kind of condition to see why it's behaving the way it does, because it's behaving very badly. Okay? It's mischievous, it's erratic, it's unruly, and it's disobedient. Now, hopefully, it'll grow up. It'll get past this stage. But it's not unusual to see this kind of behavior as the technology begins to feel its strength, mature, find its way in life, and set its principles. So I'm optimistic about that. So let's look at this brief history. I'm going to read to you a prediction and wonder if anybody in the room knows who made this prediction. I'll read it to you. It will be possible for a businessman in New York to dictate instructions and have them instantly appear in type at his office in London or elsewhere. He'll be able to call up from his desk and talk to any telephone subscriber on the globe. An inexpensive instrument, no bigger than a watch, will enable its bearer to hear anywhere, on sea or land, music or song, the speech of a political leader, the address of an eminent man of science, or the sermon of an eloquent clergyman. Delivered in some other place, however distant, in the same manner any picture, character, drawing, or print can be transferred from one to the other place. Who said that? No, it wasn't, wasn't Bush. <laughs> that man, Tesla. Nikola Tesla, a giant of his years, and it's more than 100 years ago. This man was talking about the internet, if you parse it correctly. He didn't mention video because there was no video. The vision was there. These things were in the air for a century. We had to wait for the technology to reach the right point before we could implement it. So there's relatively nothing new under the sun, if you like to repeat that. So let's look at before the beginning, what happened. Well, in 1957, Sputnik was launched. And it caught the United States basically embarrassed. So then President Eisenhower formed the Advanced Research Projects Agency to support science and technology and gain the lead in those domains. And so the early role of ARPA in creating the internet that we enjoy today, we're going to trace that a bit right now. Licklider, in 1962, became the first head of the Information Process and Techniques Office. That was the group that supported the computer science research. Ivan Sutherland became the next director in 1964. He tried to establish a three-node network at UCLA. It failed. It failed not for technical reasons, political jealousies, something with which we're all familiar. It did stall. But the idea of a network was now present at ARPA. The seeds were being planted. A year later, Larry Roberts ran an experiment with Tom Merrill to send a dial-up connection across the United States from Lincoln Laboratory to Systems Development Corporation. They succeeded, but it was a great deal of trouble. There was no, no protocol, no error control, no signaling. It just has a sloppy, difficult job, and it convinced everybody that we really needed a technology. So continuing this now, Bob Taylor came in as the next director in 1966, and he recognized that all the groups he was supporting had computers that should be shared. And at the moment, they could not share. So he decided, let's get a network, put them in a network, and let everybody share the resources of those machines. He brought Larry Roberts in to make it happen as chief scientist. And I'm going to stall right now and pause on the ARPA story to see what else was happening in that time. What was happening is there was another thread of inquiry taking place. It was basically in the research community. So while ARPA was being developed, the research community was developing the underpinnings of the technology to drive the internet. There were three efforts there. One of them was the MIT effort, my PhD dissertation. And the key work was done in early 61 and in early 62. There was a second effort at Rand Corporation. Paul Barron, he was looking at survivable communications. His main paper was September of 66. 
A third effort over here in the UK, Donald Davies, he put together the, a one-node network early on. He's the one who coined the word packet. His work is in the mid-66. Mid Unfortunately, the UK did not support a multi-node network. And had they done that, the keynote of today would have spoken to you with a British accent. But it didn't happen. One of those stories that's worth understanding. So we had this technology, data networks, highly efficient, a new technology, a new market. We, we spread it around to the carriers of the world. Nobody cared. In fact, they said it wouldn't work. And they said, even if it does work, we want nothing to do with it. That was the mentality we had to face. However, ARPA was poised in the background with a need for a network. And there, the technology was available. So if you summarize what happens is, Licklider had described a galactic network vision in 1960 and 62. I had laid out the mathematical theory of this technology. Ivan had basically tried a network. Taylor said, we need it. Larry was there to make it happen. And son of a gun, this thing began to flow. So let's look at the beginning again. In 1967, just around that period, ARPA gathered a bunch of people together and said, let's create a request for proposal. And that request for proposal went out. Part of the specification was through Wes Clark. He said, don't put the communications load on the host. Put it in a separate machine. We now call those things routers and packet switches. It was a major contribution. And by the way, you're going to see pictures of many of the personalities that are sitting around this room here at this gathering. I'm going to flash them up very quickly, so you have to watch quickly. And hopefully, you'll bump into them along the way. RFP went out to deliver a network in September 69. BBN won the contract, and Frank Hart led the effort, and Bob Kahn did the system design in 1968. It was also decided that UCLA would be the first node on this network. In 69, we put out a press release. Another vision was put forward, a vision which is still not realized. It was to be ubiquitous. It was to be always on. It was to provide, basically, web-based IP services and to be invisible. Well, the internet is anything but invisible today. So on August 29th, the first switch arrived at UCLA. That was a Labor Day weekend. On the Tuesday following Labor Day, on September 2nd, the first computer was connected, the first piece of internet equipment ever. So what did it look like in 69? Well, that little thing there was the host computer running a timeshare system at UCLA before September. In September, that switch arrived. It's called an interface message processor, the packet switch, the router, if you will. That's what it looks like. It looks like a large refrigerator. We still have that machine. It's the first piece of internet equipment ever. It's a very sophisticated machine with a great front panel. If you look inside, this machine is so ugly, you have to love it. It's beautiful. It, really, it smells good. It has its own odor. So now next month, in October of 69, SRI's host received its switch. And there you see the first piece of the internet backbone ever, running at a blazing speed of 50,000 bits per second. And in those days, that was fast, very fast. So we decided to keep a log. That's what it looks like. That is probably the most important document on the internet. It records something, as you'll see in just a moment. You see, it's an engineer's log. It doesn't look like a Madison Avenue log. It's not a business. It's, it's a real engineer's log. We took an old log and, and adapted it. And who promoted us to keep a log of our activities? Who was smart enough to do that? The famous John Postel. There he is. We miss you, John. The most important entry in that log, which makes it the most important document on the internet, in my mind, is the following. On October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night, there's an entry there which says, we talk to SRI host to host. Essentially, that is a record of the first message ever on the internet. It connected UCLA through its switch, through the high-speed line, to the switch at SRI, to the host at SRI. So the question is, what was that first message? Was it really something good, like what God hath wrought, basically, from Samuel Moss more than a century ago? Watson, come here, I need you, the first telephone message. Or more recently, one giant leap for mankind, Neil Armstrong, when he stepped on the moon. Those guys were smart. They understood public media. They understood how to get the message out and get known. Every one of us knows those messages. A century and a half later, we had no clue. All we wanted to do was to log in. 
from my machine to theirs. And to log in, you have to type L-O-G. And the I-N, the remote machine will type because it's smart enough to know what you're doing. So we got it already. Here's the setup again. We had, essentially, Charlie Klein down at my machine typing in and Bill Duval up at the SRI machine. And we had a telephone connection just in case. So we started. We had to type L-O-G. So we typed the L and said, you get the L? Except, got the L. <laughs> type the O, you get the O? Got the O. Type the G, you get the G? Crash. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so what was the first message ever on the internet? Hello. As in, lo and behold, we couldn't have asked for a more succinct prophetic message than that by accident. But it's the best one ever, and hopefully no one will ever forget that. So let's watch the internet grow. We have now 40 years of history to catch up. Steve Crocker, who's here as well, he put out the first RFC, number one, describing the host-host protocol, also set up network working group. Vint was in that same group. So was John Postel and a few others, Charlie Klein. A year later, that team produced the network control program, which was the first host-host protocol. That same year, Norm Abramson developed the first packet radio network, AlohaNet. Ray Thomason comes out two years later with email on the internet. It was well known in time sharing systems, made a big splash on the internet. First public demonstration that same year of the ARPANET. We just deployed a satellite network connection across the ocean, first international connection at 73. Bob and Vint developed and published the concept of TCP in 73. Metcalf develops Ethernet the same year. Basically, the management of the ARPA that was now transferred to the Defense Communications Agency, whereas we at UCLA had been measuring the heck out of it and stressing it and testing it, DC, I don't think, ever made another measurement. We, nobody knows how the internet works today. And they stopped looking at what's going on. 77, TCP connects three networks, a very significant connection across the ocean and back for some simple communications, showed the power of interneting. 78, split TCP into, uh, into TCP and IP, basically allow UDP to come along, thanks to Danny Cohn, Dave Reed, and John Schock. CSNet was conceived to allow any university to connect in, Larry Landweber, Dave Farber, Tony Hearns, and uh, Peter Denning. No, network, no machine can now connect to the internet without using TCP IP as its protocol, 83 split into Milnet and Alpanet in 83. 84, domain name system developed, Paul Marco Petrus, he's here as well. NSFnet comes online, Steve Wolf and Dave Mills. Robert Morris unleashes the first internet worm. Uh-oh, <laughs> suddenly something funny happened. For 20 years, this is a well-behaved network. What is that? It was, eh, don't worry about it. What a mistake. We should have really been alert at that point. We said, an aberration, no problem. That was prophetic when showing us basically signs of things to come. 88, National Research Council puts out a report that I, I chaired a con conference on talking about the National Research Network. Al Gore basically supported that. And from that, we led to the gigabit networks uh, under President, first President Bush. ARPANET replaced by NSFNet. 91, the World Wide Web suddenly is made available. You guys get formed, 1982, happy 20th anniversary. A million hosts on the internet, 1992. Mosaic browser released, 1993. Andreessen and Eric Brin. Cantor and Siegel introduced spam in 1994. Uh-oh. And this time, ouch. This one hurt. These two folks, Cantor and Siegel, they actually used our internet to send out a commercial advertisement. You ever hear of something like that? It was the first mass mailing on purpose to a large piece of the community. And there, by the way, is the first spam ever. It was April 12, 1994. They were promoting their services to help you get access to a lottery for a green card. Well, we really got upset when we saw that. So we sent email back to those folks. Said, no, don't do that. Shame on you. Stop. Bad. We sent so much email back to them, we took down their server. And so an unintended consequence of the first spam was the creation of the first denial of service attack. <laughs> Such is life. But 
now is out of the bag. From then on, till now, and into the future, we have these kinds of things causing problems. So what are the enablers of the internet, if you think about it? It allows anyone to reach hundreds of millions, billions of people. How? Easily, quickly, no basic cost, and anonymously. What better formula for the dark side of the internet? And so the enablers that made the network so popular, so successful in the first 20 years, now in the 25th year, was creating essentially the dark side. And the dark side, I don't have to elaborate on all the lovely bits of it, but it's, it's causing consternation all over the world. So here's an example of a dark side. Um, suppose you saw a message like that. <laughs> now look at the choices you get. <laughs> I can thank Bill Cheswick for that one. Beautiful example of the kinds of things we have to face every day. So continuing the growth of the internet, 95, Netscape comes out, starts the dot-com boom, new model, eyeballs matter, cash does not. Bill Gates launches Windows 95 and says, hmm, there's something called the internet out there. And he steers that battleship around and points it directly at the internet, and he targets Netscape. Of course, Netscape didn't survive very long after that. Deregulation of the data networks in 96. More email than postal mail in the United States, same year. Wi-Fi standard comes out in 1997. Barry Liner puts out a paper with a number of the early pioneers as joint authors, some of them in this room again, classic paper. Blogs begin to appear in 98. Napster rolls out, Sean Fannin and Sean Parker, 1999. Dot-com bubble begins to burst. Now things begin to unravel a bit in 2000. English is no longer the major language of the internet. 2001, 2001, Wikipedia is launched. We're going to hear all about that from Jimmy in just a moment, Jimmy Wales. Half a billion users in 2001. MySpace launched. Facebook launched. Mark Zuckerberg, 2004. Google is now the darling of the internet. What could be better? More benign, do no evil, wonderful system. Grokster closes down, 2005, due to a Supreme Court decision. YouTube launched not too long ago. ATT disappears. <laughs> ATT reappears. <laughs> SBC took over the names. You, you can't keep these things down. Google Maps and Google Earth appear. MySpace exceeds Google page views. A bit of a shock to Google. Next year, is Google evil? Those questions are being asked back and forth. This is, now we have a battleground, basically, of the giants in the industry. YouTube is purchased by Google for almost $2 billion. ATT is now the largest US carrier again. By the way, ATT went down because they had some of the best scientists in the world and some of the worst managers, and they died of stupidity. But that's another story. <laughs> 2007, Apple launches the iPhone. Microsoft buys Facebook, $15 billion valuation. Google announces Android, their smartphone. A billion cell phones sold in 2007. That number's small now. Twitter comes on 2007. GPS everywhere, in your phones and all around your cars. Apple opens the App Store, 2008. Facebook overtakes MySpace. More Chinese on the internet than American, 2008. Financial crisis, things again begin to unravel in a different way now. Cloud computing takes over, iPad introduced. ATT phases out unlimited data usage, a major change in the way people use their mobile phones, significant economic impact. WikiLeak leaks. <laughs> Facebook is the most visited website. Live streaming of that royal couple's wedding was the biggest event ever to be watched on the web. And yet the younger generation didn't think it was such a great thing. <laughs> you can't find that picture on the web anymore. That's the power of censorship. Same year, at UCLA, we do a similar kind of thing. We, we announce an internet history center, and that younger generation is still there, <laughs> doing their thing, understanding it the way they do. That happens to be the original imp sitting in its original location. How many revolutions, big revolutions, French Revolution, Industrial Revolution, can, do you know where well, you can point to the exact spot where it occurred? We got the exact four square feet where that switch started the internet. So that's worth our looking at. Arab Spring, basically, the connectivity that helped fuel it. Microsoft by Skype for billions of dollars. 
Google buys patents for over $10 billion. Intel's buying patents. Facebook's buying companies that you wonder about, a billion dollars. Microsoft buys patents. Everybody's buying patents these days. So it's beginning, beginning to become a, a, a legal protection and legal attack world. So were those events, any one of them, critical to the growth of the internet? The web, okay. Facebook, email. No. The internet's been growing exponentially ever since day one in the number of attached devices. And it continues to grow. It's been a sequence of important events that has allowed it to grow to the 2 billion we heard and beyond. So who brought all this to, to us? I've shown you the pictures. Here are the early pioneers. Then we get the implementers. Then we get the value adders. Then we get the launchers. And then we get the billionaires. <laughs> Time goes down the page. It took many years for those technologies to blossom into the basically financial giants that we have today. So what are the next phases of the internet? One phase, nomadic computing. Wherever you go, you can get attached. Well, that's already happened. Nomadic computing is a reality now. And better technology. We're going to take cyberspace out from behind the screen of your laptops and machines and smartphones into the physical space. The hook is coming up here. Ubiquitous computing, wherever you go, it'll be available to you. Smart space everywhere. And software agents to support you. But all of that is infrastructure. There's a whole other world of applications and services. The infrastructure is easy to predict. The application and services are almost impossible. We've constantly been surprised by them. A long sequence of applications have come to us out of the blue. We didn't see them coming. What are the examples? OK, email early on. World Wide Web, peer-to-peer, -peer, file sharing, social networking, blogs, user-generated content. It is safe to predict that we will be unable to predict those applications in the future. They'll continue to come out of the blue, hit us in the side of the head, and grow. And that's the beauty and the opportunity of the internet. It's all out there for all of us in this room and the younger generations to continue to produce creative works. So where do we go from here? Well, all the obvious things from the infrastructure. Everything's going to be converged, content, function, apps, services. We're going to be able to see significant changes in the way you do everything, as I said. There's going to be a world full of extreme mobility that's already become apparent. Mass personalization, that's not an oxymoron. Basically, video addiction, location-based services, social networking, applications we can't predict and they will surprise us. Change in the way we do everything in our world, societies, the way they organize. The infrastructure, to summarize, we're going to have basically a pervasive global nervous system on this planet. In terms of the applications and services, no one's in charge. It's the Wild West. Surprising apps, great opportunity, an open world. So we've come a long way. We've come a long way as we progressed. Uh, and as technologies come online, you can wonder. So thank you very much. Appreciate